Okay, we're good to go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our keynote event for OHA 2020 in a time of revelation with Joyce J. Scott. My name is Kelly Elaine Avies, and I am the uh, programming co-chair along with Shanna Farrell for this year's conference. There were many hands involved in making this virtual conference happen, and I'd like to thank them all, especially uh, Christine McCusker, Louis Kiriakoudis, and Faith Bagley in the executive office, our outgoing president, Allison Tracy Taylor, president-elect or president Dan Kerr, vice president Amy Starcheski, Linda Shopes, Catherine Mayfield, and the entire local arrangements committee, and Anna Kaplan as well. Shanna Farrell will be monitoring questions. Of course, I'm thanking Shanna Farrell in that list. Um, she, we've been working closely together this past year. And she will be monitoring questions in the chat room. So if you have questions, put them in the chat room. And at the end, she will um, speak those questions out loud. Oral historians are concerned with storytelling. If there's a story involved, we want to listen. Joyce J. Scott is a master griot who works primarily in the visual arts, but has been known to use performance art and spoken word as well. In fact, we got a little taste of that just before this session began. As I was preparing this introduction, I realized I couldn't say it much better than the bio she provided, which seems to have been written with oral historians in mind. Joyce J. Scott was born in Baltimore in 1948. Her parents were both born to sharecroppers in North Carolina and migrated to Baltimore in the 1930s and 40s where Joyce was born and raised. Scott comes from a rich background of quilting and beading starting at the early age of three when she began sewing with her mother and first teacher, Elizabeth T. Scott. Decades later, she is a, a recent recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award and continues to create stunningly beautiful and powerful works. Scott's extensive body of work has traversed styles and mediums ranging from intricate jewelry to two and three dimensional figurative sculptures, installations, and her most recent projects, which integrate her trademark bead work with blown glass sculptures created in collaboration with artisans in Murano, Italy. Scott repositions craft as a potent and expressive platform for social commentary. Many works investigate her personal history as well as social and political injustices sexism, violence, and racism as they face our society. Joyce J. Scott received a BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art, an MFA from the Instituto Allende in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, and training from her mother, Elizabeth T. Scott, who was an internationally recognized fiber artist. Her work has appeared in solo and group exhibitions at the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and many others. Her work is held in the public collections of numerous national and international museums, including Baltimore Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum of Art, Detroit Institute of the Arts, Los Angeles County Museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Smithsonian, the Washington, and here in Washington, DC, uh, the Philadelphia M Museum of Art, among others. I had the privilege of conducting an oral history interview with Joyce J. Scott almost 20 years ago for the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African-American History and Culture. I'm pretty sure she doesn't remember me, but I will never forget spending time in the dazzling art space she calls home and listening to her talk about her life and work. This is her reply to the question, what is it about Baltimore that draws you and keeps you? I'm very much Baltimorean. Well, you know, it has a big, a real history. I love East Coast history. I love that there are people who are direct descendants from a very hard, hard time in this country's history and who have become the winners. I love living on the East Coast in houses that are made of brick, that are smashed together, that are real communities. I love being able to walk outside of my house and take public transportation and go to a restaurant. I love that we're in the South, but we're not in the deep South or that we're not deep in the South. I love that we're kind of Mason Dixon-ish so I have a lot of the Southern stuff, but I have Northern too. I have many things that I hope to help and change by being a good citizen and by helping to show my artwork and teach sometimes. I think the city is in flux. We don't have a lot of money. We're in change. And I hope that my staying here can help it be a better place like somebody did for me. There are some other things I'll tell you that I really like about Baltimore because I am a Baltimore file. This is a city that's absolutely packed with artists. 
artists who do wonderful work, different ethnic groups, different ages, genders, different mediums from visual work, sculptors, painters, mixed media artists, jewelers, fiber artists, you name it. There's a real theater, alternative theater and theater group community here. There's a real group of poets here. There are literary people here, you name it, we're here. There are dancers here and I think they fight Maybe sometimes the hardest because the dancing is kind of difficult here in Maryland, but there are still dancers here. There's a reason to be happy about being here. I like that we still have Arabers, Arabs who come to the city and still sell you food from the wagon. I can literally hear the horse clapping on the ground. And this was just one answer. Without further ado, Joyce J. Scott, thank you. I'm not scared of dying and I don't really care. If it's peace you find and dying, well then let my time be near. If it's peace you find and dying and if dying time is near, then bundle up my coffin cause it's cold way down there. Troubles are many, they're as deep as a well. I can say there ain't no heaven and I'll pray there ain't no hell. Say there ain't no heaven and I'll pray there ain't no hell, oh no. But I'll never know by living only by dying will tell. Give me my freedom for as long as I be. All I ask a living is to have no chains on me. All I ask of living is to have no chains on me. And ooh, all I ask of dying is to go naturally. I, I only want to go naturally. I, and when I die, and when I'm gone, there'll be one child born. There'll be one child born left. There'll be one child born left to carry all. Oh, oh, oh. Carry on. Hi, everybody. Let's start, uh, Mr. Keynote, let's start those uh, images if we haven't already. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me here today. Go back to the one we just, the one that was just on. Yeah, because that's my mom, Elizabeth Caldwell Calford Scott. You heard about me. Yes, my parents are from North and South Carolina. My father picked tobacco and my mother picked cotton. They both picked different kinds of vegetables. But I come from a rich background of craftspeople, quilters on my father's side and quilters, clay people, musicians and storytellers on both sides. Why did I call this like a time of reckoning? Well, it is for me, and I think it is for other people too, because there's some pandemicalization going on out there. I'm home. I've been working a lot. Next slide, please. I'm pushing myself beyond what I usually do. That's because I have the time. This piece is 45 feet, inches long. And it's a fairy, it's a fairy tale. It's a graphic novel. And it's all made by tiny beads. I want you to walk up to the work and say, who had the audacity to do that? I wonder if she's blind. Oh my, that's Joy Scott. Next. A lot of my work has to do with gender, has to do with ethnicity and social problems. So here a pregnant woman is standing on some kind of plinth, some kind of edifice. And beadwork and glass mosaic is, is what's covering this base. You know, my parents left the South during the Great Migration. 
because they just wanted to walk around their their own country neighborhood without being frightened of going going out of the house and being way late at night. They wanted to be able to have a kind of freedom that allowed them to have time off, to not be cheated on their salaries. They wanted a kind of urban life because they they wanted to have a, a fuller life. And out of that came a lot of stories. Next, the way I parlay my story, aside from years being a performance artist, art is my my first real performance work was with Kayla Wall, and I say that meaning professional. We were called the Thunder Thigh Review, and we went all over the United States, Scotland, Holland, Canada, performing one of a kind, first person theater pieces. Now this was the time of uh, Whoopi Goldberg, so you can imagine what we were doing. I as a visual artist, and I wrote a lot of it, made all the props and I was good looking. We had on spandex and black lace. And Kay is a director, performer, and one of the writers. You know, the piece you're seeing now, the necklace, it's got a story to it, but I don't always know what that's about. I just know that I want people to luxuriate in beauty. I want people to make up their own ideas about I'm doing, what I'm doing. And I like very, very much to have the power. See, a lot of people don't want to talk about being powerful, but I, I love having the power to induce some kind of desire in someone. And I don't mean that in a dirty way. Well, maybe I do, but no. I'm talking about the desire to learn from, the desire to be in, embraced by this beadwork, whether it's on your body or whether you're viewing it. Next. Now, I'm a roundaway girl from Sandtown, the area where Freddie Gray lost his life, the beginning of his life. I remember growing up across the street from the projects. I remember being that girl who was loved by her neighborhood and walked, you know, to school and came back. It took an entire community to raise me. And that was one of the beauties of that community. And it fostered in me this desire to create artwork. I love making things that you wear because it beckons people to come up to you. Not only because it's beautiful. I mean, once I, I did a, neck, a necklace with the N-word on it. I've been cautioned not to say the N-word out because some people are really upset. And I didn't even know who bought it, but I was doing a residency in San Antonio, Texas. <clears throat> Excuse me, and this older white doyen came up to, <coughs> up to me, wearing cowboy. <coughs> that was a surprise. This older, Texas lady, I call her Doyen. She was a white lady. She came up to me with cowboy boots on and she had my necklace on backwards. So I said, firstly, why are you wearing that? <laughs> she told me she loved it. She loved how social it made her. I said, so why is it backwards? Did People are gonna have trouble reading it. She said, I know. So they get all up on it. And when they get close to me and see that it's the N word, they also wanna ask me why I would wear it. And then that's why I get to talk to them about social injustice, institutional racism. And I as a white person also understand that it exists. Now, now isn't that wonderful? Storytelling isn't that first person connection. Next, I am someone who just likes to make artwork. Sometimes I'll take an African sculpture like this. This is probably almost 30 inches tall and I'll dress it just like we would dress um, a saint in a Catholic church. Sometimes I don't even know what they're about. I just know I'm supposed to tackle it next. 
This is called War Woman. This is cast and blown glass and an African sculpture because many times women, if they're not fighting, they're taking care of what still exists of the family and the home. I call this being in a time of revelation in a time of reckoning because we don't realize, I think, always how easy it would be for us to be in that situation. I just saw a woman on TV yesterday who was from Venezuela. She's going to vote for Trump because she's afraid of socialism. But she said something very important to me. She said we were a wealthy democracy, and look where we are now. So I'm hoping that my work, some kind of fulcrum, it's some kind of flypaper that gets you stuck on it. And by the time you've unstuck yourself, maybe there's a residue that talks to you about the importance of the issues that I try to tackle in my work. Next. Artists are in a special place, especially griots, especially storytellers, those people who keep the history. Now, you're the one, so I'm speaking to the choir, but I'm talking about when you're the aunt like me who doesn't get to be invited to Christmas and to Thanksgiving because I'm too crazy. Next, they get invited to one and, and you get to tell them stories about where you've been and what people should expect next. How you've lived your life and how it's very, very different for them. And one of the best things to do is to do it with a zesty song or something that your mom told you. That's what I try to imbue in my work. This is another war woman piece. I also want people to know that I'm not interested in being in the crowd. I'm not interested in being one of. I'm as, well, I'm the one. Now I know that soaked with hubris and you're like, who does she think she is? How deaf. Why else am I on this earth? Am I placed here to just hang out with the rabble? Am I placed here to do things that are all right? I believe I'm placed here to have such extreme and entrancing endeavors in my life and that I should be able to relate them within my artwork. Next. And the reason why I do that is not just because I'm that kind of person. Next. I do it because of the people whose shoulders I stand on. It's funny, that should come up when I say it. Because they told me stories about how they were sexual objects. So I did a whole series on the sexual objectification of African-American men and women. You know, I realized that I could become very rich if I just made black penises. But then I thought, well, wait, who's buying these and why? Am I feeding the idea of sexual objectification by making penises that are a sexual object for somebody? Because the majority of people are not African-American who buy them. So I sought other ways to talk about sexual objectification. Next. This one's about the sex trafficking and the sex trade. I did this when I was in Italy. Now, before I talk about this, you have to think about me in Italy. I come in with a big red blonde wig, glasses, dripping in uh, velvet because it was cold, and singing. <laughs> they love opera. They have no idea who or what I am. In my kiss, you fight a yes. Oh, me. Yeah. I had actually three different times in that workshop, and I can tell you we grew together. I learned a great deal, and so did they. It was my opportunity to work with people who really 
aren't Americans who don't have our nuttiness. And when I say that, I can go to an American studio and say, okay, let's do this, let's do that, da, 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 and they'll say, it's stupid. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> Working with them, there was a different kind of elan. <clears throat> they were very classically trained and women were not a lot in these studios. So here I was, in essence, the boss. And coming up with ideas like putting beads in or making a gun that's over five feet tall. And then telling them that that woman is strapped on that gun because it talks about her being sexually molested and forced to be in a trade that took her treasure. They talked about why this because it's my practice, it's the way I speak. <clears throat> Next. I not only revel in the glory of being an African-American woman, I think speaking truth to power is speaking truth, all truth. I'm really perturbed by something that's been happening in basically five countries in Africa where African albinos, people with albinism, are culled, are waylaid, <clears throat> are killed or are maimed. <coughs> this just started. I have no idea where this is coming from. Just because they look different. Someone can look at them and no longer see them as their cousins who just have a dim tone. This is a flayed African. You can put it in your hand and look at it and its genitals. This is what we do to each other. <clears throat> Next. This is one of the pieces I made in Italy. You see, you know what earlier when I was talking about, I wanna be the best, I wanna be the one. That really isn't just because I have a giant ego. It's because how else will I be able to place myself somewhere where I can help others? So I'm in Italy and I decided to do a series on Buddha. This is really a thing, a black woman doing Buddha. Kiss your flap, perché? Firstly, are you saying I can't? Because I can. As an artist, as a human, all the things are available to me. So I made a series and this one is Buddha, fire and water because they were about the four seasons, not the singing group four hours, four different times of the day. <clears throat> Why am I dealing with glass? Because in many ways it's so translucent. And that translucency is what I'm working towards in my artwork and in myself, because I'm an old hippie. I love the idea that I can reckon with things that confound me through this kind of natural material. It's just sand. I like that the Egyptians used it to make all kinds of things, including eyeglasses. I like that every time I do it in beadwork, I'm using ancient forms to tell contemporary stories. This is great power. Artists are very powerful now because we, unlike many, can pursue our desires while the rest of the world burns. We just need our materials and the creative force within us. That's what I'm going for. Next. It's another Buddha. This is Buddha in winter. I like to get people going. 
That's how you get people to say things sometimes that they wouldn't have said. Not necessarily bad things, just stuff pops out. So there's a face on the leg. I ask him, Beringo, would you please get me some, you know, markers? Sure, why not? He always said to me, why not? And I called him Bad and Negro. Why not? I said, do you know what? I'm calling you Black Beringo. Do you, do you know anything about what's happening? And I say, sure, why not? Okay. So he brought me those and I started drawing on the glass. And he's like, every time I move, you do something different. Why are you drawing on this? Because I can. Why am I alive right now making art the way I do? Not only because I can, it's because I must. It's my way of speaking to the rabble right now. It's my way of being involved politically and socially in the best way that I have. This is my voice. Next. It's another Buddha, a woman sitting in the clouds. Next, so my mom used to tell me that it was so hard for her sometimes just because she was dark skinned. She was a funny lady. She always had all kinds of stories. One time she told me that they were at the well getting water and her sister, Queen Esther, was the one that the boys, white and black, were always around. So there, there was a day that they got in a fight, everybody. And she told me a little baby came up to her, waddled up to her, tried to get in a fight and she picked it up and she threw it at people. My mother used a small child as a weapon. This piece is not only about the sexual objectification of women, like what I'm talking about with my mother's sister. It's about how women lose their power. This is from uh, a series on rape. And this woman is from Dafur. You can hold her in your hand and look at her. Sometimes they do such weird things to people, tie them up and, and leave them by the side of the road. Next, they might decapitate them. They might make their children sit with them. This is a wall hanging of a woman who's committing suicide because she has no life after this. And in fact, she's living as the dead. Next. Some women go out and they gather wood. Next. It's another woman who is uh, an African sculpture that I've beaded and I've covered her. I've enriched her. But this is also a tradition in parts of Africa as well. I'm an African-American woman who lives and straddles a variety of lines. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. And I say that my parents were sharecroppers. That means that their parents and grandparents were probably slaves. In fact, I know they were slaves. I talked to them about that time in their life. I just found out that my father's father was born in 1866. I never met him. One year after the end of slavery for most. Boy, the stories he could have told. Next. I try to do that within my artwork. It's very important. Another thing that I like to do about my art is just be audacious. I don't have to do what everybody else does with the 
beadwork or with glass. I can put a ship on somebody's head. I can mix African art, cast work from African art, have artwork blown and just cobbled together and mosaiced because I have the power. The podea, this is really important to know, I think for me, because having this power is a, it's a big responsibility. I mean, I'm loopy. I don't know if you've noticed it. It's a big deal for me to like make artwork. I <laughs> must submit. When I go to the studio, I have to leave this junky bunky person at the door, all 12 or 13 of them, and attempt to submit to my position as a student in my studio where I am learning each day how to reiterate my technique. Each day I learn something. Many times it's not about beadwork. And many times those things that I learn, especially not about beadwork, they show themselves in the art. Next. 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 These pieces, these pieces that you're looking at, unlike this one, are usually around 24 inches tall. So they're large pieces of glass. But I decided to do a series called Black Blonde. You know, there's this whole thing about us and hair. There are very few true blondes in the world. Most people have dyed hair. So Africans also dye their hair blonde or they wear wigs or they do all kinds of braiding. And the idea of what it looks like for a classically attired African woman with the dark hue to be playing with this blonde hair. Cause you know, she's saying, you're not the boss of me. Next. I do things about uh, sexuality too. I should really more say sensuality. This is a woman whose lover is the devil. He's just a little demon. His size doesn't matter here, is what he could do. And there she is, she's submitting to him. Try to explain that to Italian men in the studio. No, but her feet and her hand, no, no, that's really kind of a surrealistic, I like that. But uh, why is she turning, uh, she doesn't have clothes, I know, just trust me on this. Next. It's another piece on sex. I knew that this figure was going to be playing with some guy and she was faceless and her face would come from his ejaculation. Now, trust me, I have no idea why I did that, but it's one of the strongest pieces that I made. And of course it sold right away. The test for me was to make that figure alluring and also not venal and not trashy. That's not pornography. That talks about the beauty of a sexual relationship between two people, however they want to do it. Next. Two years ago by now, I believe. I had a very large one person exhibition at Grounds for Sculpture, which is a sculpture park in New Jersey, Hamilton, really close to Princeton. And I, I knew that I wanted to do a piece. In fact, I knew this whole piece should be related to Harriet Tubman. So the name of this show was called Harriet Tubman and Other Truths. And I chose Harriet Tubman because she really made me think of my mom. They were both feisty, dark-skinned, short ladies who had the temerity 
to walk through life as they did. So this is one of Harriet's guns. These are the flowers that she would see as she was running with people through the, the different woods and wilderness to get to freedom. It's blown and cast glass. Next. That's me working at Grounds for Sculpture. Lowry Sims is one of the curators. I get to actually form the work to become part of it. It's very one person, one-on-one. -on -one. It's revelatory. It's spiritually elevating. It's the truth right there in your own hands. Next. Next. This is from the Ancestry Progeny series. You couldn't choose your grandparents and they couldn't choose you. So the foundation for us is truly built on the integration of people, whether they want it to be or not. And this culmination, this stacking, makes for some very zesty combinations. Next. I like to be sly in the work that I do. I like you to say, no, she didn't, what? What the? So I've done a series on making jokes on crockery, on the things that we think are pretty, things that we maybe even think talk about history, right? Things that talk about how people see each other. A lot of this crockery was made in Japan, Taiwan, China. So it's their vision of what black and white people are. This guy was playing a flute. This is about the sexual objectification of men, black men. So that's no longer a flute and it's small. You can put it up on your shelf with the rest of your, you know, little pigs and teapots and things. And then when someone comes in, they say, what, what? next. I want you to laugh like, ah, ha, ha, and go like, wait, what? This is a contemporary mammy that you can buy in Charleston, South Carolina. She was holding a rolling pin, but it didn't look like a rolling pin, so I turned it into a penis. That's once again about the power of African-American women. Next. It's also for me about the power of African-American women in places where they are supposedly powerless. You know, my mom told me all kinds of stories about knowing almost everything about the women and men that she worked for. She raised their children. She washed their drawers. She heard him talking. She knew who he was messing with because it would be in the house. She heard everything. So she was powerful in a way and many times had control over those kids in a way that even the parents didn't. This is another one about uh, giving birth. She's giving birth to guns. I don't exactly understand everything that I do. Thank God. Next. A lot of African-Americans say, you know, I'm part Indian. Certainly that's what I've been told in my life. But if we get really into the story, it's pretty deep. The whole trail of tears is the five, in quote, civilized tribes for walking to Oklahoma with their slaves. 
the Freedmen Bureau came out of that in Tulsa. In fact, there were people who got to Tulsa and ran away. And where'd they go? To Mexico. These African slaves were so important that they fought in a revolution and, and the Mexican government gave them property in Northern Mexico. So when you think about how deep that stuff is, they're probably right there where the wall is. Next. Look, mom, a doc. I like to talk about the kind of prejudice we have within our own ethnic groups. She might not have gone for that little dark skinned guy if he weren't a doctor. And he's an African sculpture, so he's African. But if he's a doctor, then that allows her a certain kind of freedom and uh, largesse. Next. I made a quilt out of beads and my mother's knots. Hand working with history for me is different than using materials that I bought in a store. My mother progressed with uh, dementia for 14 years. And one of the things she did was tie knots. They were sequentially laid next to each other. So it looked like beads. And she used them in her quilts. Something magical, alchemical about me wrapping my fingers around something that she made and taking the next step with them. Next. I love to make jewelry. This is one of the older pieces from the 70s where I'm using the loom and the peyote stitch. Next. For a while, I thought I was going to be a metal worker. I did use... Uh, the torch for a while making metal jewelry, but it was always too hot and I was always mesmerized by the fire, which meant I melted a lot of stuff. This is a giant Joyce necklace. It's a culmination of a lot of pieces that I made and charms and goo that were given to me. It's giant, it's a giant petrol and I only sold it when I knew that this person would put it in a museum with the rest of her collection. Because I believe that I don't have the ability in my house to tell the full story. But African Americans have a place in museums all over the world. And it's not just in the colored section. Our work should be viewed like everybody else because of the strength, because of the glory it brings. I want people to walk right past a wall hall. In fact, run past a war hall because there's a glistening something at the end of the room. And when they get there, they're seeing it's a black man being lynched. I want them to go home saying, what the, why would, I understand why. Next. I do things for beauty. Next. When I was in Italy, they made this uh, clear woman for me, but they were going to throw it away because they like um, the feet. I can't. You you have to we have to throw it away. It's not. Are you kidding? I come from people who make a way where there's a no way. I come from the making something out of nothing crowd. So I just brought it home and turned it upside down and made a beaded guy riding her and there's sperms around it. I, I, you know, I worked it. Next.
once again dressing a woman. That glass was made with and for me in New Orleans. So their penises, fingers, and eyes. Next. Next. Headshot. I'm in Baltimore. The place that Trump yelled about and said it was, you know, a shite hole city. It's one of the worst. Unfortunately, sometimes we prove him right when it comes to be violence. I bought that liquor bottle on my way to North Carolina in the hills. It's filled with liquor and you drink out of the hand and the gun and then I realized what a, a shot of liquor really was about. It's about a boy who's having his head blown off in the city. I don't want you to be confused by the beauty. I want you to be conjoled and consoled by the beauty, I want you to want to stand there. The top of his head is blown off. Next. I make really large installations. This one is, was in Charleston, South Carolina a really long time ago. It's a lynching. But when I was making it, I didn't tell people it was a lynching. It's around 17 feet tall because I know that I would have viewer intervention, vandalism. Next. Um, I'm gonna have to use the N word because that's the name of the piece. Nanny now, nigger later. Once again, it's about the position that African-American women had in the houses of white people. Sometimes children thought there's more time with her than there is with me, but that wasn't true. They awoke very early in the morning. Oh, 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 oh. oh Lord, and now let me get a little bit of juice, a little bit of grits, and put on some bacon and cheese. Get you ready to go to school. Give you your lunch or your 30 cents. Watch you walk down the street and, and I'd be walking down the street, but with a whole bunch of other kids, their mommies looking out of windows, either in the projects or in the second and third floor in the houses, in the different apartments. Hey, little Joyce, hey. And then she'd go, make a little omelet for you. No ham because we're kosher, but a big old bagel. And she'd take care of that kid. And then she drag herself home and do it all over again. You know, I think of them as superheroes. I have trouble carrying a designer bag, much less a 500 pound a bag of cotton. That's superheroes. Next. Rodney had, King's head was squashed like a watermelon. This was the time when he was beaten. This is owned by the Philadelphia Museum. I, it's big like a watermelon. I wasn't trying to be realistic. Next. This woman just has stuff draining out of her. She's around 11 feet long. Her first iteration was in a tree in New Orleans. You'd happen to stance upon her. You'd look up and there was a woman looking down at you with limbs coming from her. She was lynching a tree instead of it lynching her. Next. There she is in the tree. 
the way I work, especially with beadwork, which is very flexible, it is sewing. You can cut it and re revisit it. Is that I may take something like this and it may have a life that goes from place to place, just like my life goes to place to place. I'm going to work with her again and rework her. Next. Another iteration. Next. Narcissism. Some people say I know too much about this. Well, you know, there's a chemistry to working with glass and beads. They have to be chemically compatible to fuse. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And that was one of the fun things in Italy. My telling them it'll work. And it did sometimes, and sometimes it didn't. And then, boy, did they rub my face in it when it didn't. So after my first visit, I came home. I was working at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Maine. And I said to my students, where can I get old beaded, old, old Italian beads? Because if they're old and Italian, they're chemically compatible. They told me I got them. You know, I was full of myself the next year I went to Italy. And when we fused them and they kissed each other and worked beautifully, they saw beadwork in a way they wore. Next. Next. This was one of my older Buddhas, where Buddha is washing a person clean with his hands in the vagina of Yemanya. So she's the water figure in the bottom. And the charge moving through his arms is holding this figure on his head and cleansing it. There's something magical about living in the 21st century. I still have the voices whispering to me from the past. I am who I am because they are still telling me stories. Now, I know that sounds a little gurgle, but I can look at something like that and say, oh, but I remember those dolls you used to make and the stories you told me about carving things and the clay. And then I go to Africa and there it is. And I go to China and there it is. They did what they did to give me the liberty to say, oh, I've been to Hong Kong. They, they did that. I'm the recipient and just one more thunderbolt who's supposed to hit somebody else. Next. It's a large piece. Uh, a lot of people don't mosaic with beads, but I mosaic on that base with beads and glass. And then glass work on top of the beads. Next. So I started doing these wall hangings with tiny little beads. I really wanted you to walk up and say, I can't even imagine a person would do that. Why? That must have taken hours. It did. And I just cut this piece up and I'm going to make it even bigger. I think about my mom who didn't read and write very well, who went to a one-room schoolhouse. My father did also. I think about all the times they were in the field so I would not have to be. I shall not be denied. And I shall not make half-ass work. I just want to knock myself out. Well, I don't really want to, like, you know, fall out. But I want to consistently go beyond what I thought I could do before. Because that's what they were. 
I want a little bit of that soup over here. Dun, 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 dun. That's where I want to be. And the great part is that is being able to be a teacher or a mentor to someone else. Next. So when I was, you know, at Grounds for Sculpture, I got to get in a cherry picker again. This is wonderful for me because I'm a big woman. I get to you do this and it shakes. The guys are yelling, stop. And it also means that I get to work on bigger things. So that is a 15 foot Harriet Tubman. They in a silly way said, you can do what you want to do. I said, okay, so I want to make a 15 foot Harriet Tubman made out of dirt. The show's going to be up for months. I want her to slowly disappear the way she did in our memories. This is wonderful. But this time she'll be laughing for a different I'm reason. A big woman. I get to you do this. I can tell you that I went up. We did a lot of work. People were working with me. That's not even my hat. I took the hat off one of the guys. You don't need this. I don't want to have sunburn. Thank you. I'm old. I can do that. Next. And that piece became this piece. So I said, you know what we're going to do? And I, you meaning what I told them to do? We're going to spray paint that and do graffiti on Harriet Tubman. What? That's right. Just like you do on a, a wall, because those little dots and schmickles that you see are my beadwork on her body. Said, so you're going to spray paint it and, and we're going to write on it. We're going to spray paint this dirt. It won't, it'll work. Then I had him write a portion of a letter that Frederick Douglass wrote to Harriet Tubman. She asked him to please write liner notes or something for her because there was a book being written about her and she really knew that him saying something would validate it and help it to sell. And he wrote a letter to her that was so brilliant. He said, of course I'll do it. I talk and write about it. You actually go in and free people. I found that to be so uplifting that we put it on her body. And she's holding a, a probably a 14 uh, foot gun rifle. You know, they say she had a rifle. Sometimes she had a pistol, it said. She used to cut down stuff, cut down trees and stuff. So sometimes she's with an ax. My mom was like that. She had a little gun. So the story about that is she slept in the back of the house. And when the birds got too loud, she'd go out and bing, 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 shoot at them. Shut the F up. And they'd fly away. I swear they came back just so that they could hear her yell. Next. It's me digging. Next. Next. This is another angle of the piece that you saw at the very beginning. Next. I think we're almost there, folks. It's another one of those pieces that's a combination from Italy, my beadwork, Africa, you name it. Next. A bell jar. She's this one is on skin bleaching. She's very, very, very light, this sculpture. And I wasn't sure if this, because of her dress, was the making an Asian woman or an African American, I'm sorry, an African woman who bleached herself so white. Next.
woman in a watermelon. That's my beadwork on that yellow that's been fused to the glass and twisted around and pulled. Next. Next. Okay, so we've seen this again. Why don't we end the slides here? There's some things I'd like to say before we do questions. You know, when I said that I, um, that I, I want it to be it, that I am it, I want to be this, this font, this PowerPoint, this wonderful, wonderful heat. It is because of people like my mom. There's an old song, actually Jubilee Singers, who sang this a lot. That my mom always talked to me about and said that I was it. And I'm saying that's what you are. That's what we all are. And it's what I try to imbue in my work. You know, in the old days, my family wasn't allowed to talk about their gifts not outside of the realm of the cousins or their family. And they were potters and weavers. You were supposed to hide your light under a bushel. You weren't supposed to show it. But my mom said, don't do that. Share it. My parents ate shite so I could have sugar. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I am going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Thank you. Questions? Civil comments? Don't ask me how much I weigh. No, I'm not cross-eyed. It's the glasses. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Joyce. That was really uh, that was really special. And seeing all of your images and hearing you talk about them was was really wonderful. So thank you. Uh, we do have one question um, that uh, from Amy Evans, who asks um, if you document the stories or inspiration behind your work, and if you do document that, how do you docu how do you do that? Well, people record lectures. Really, I worked with the Thunder Thighs. We were together all of the 80s for 10 years. Uh, we've been filmed. I used to teach a lot. You know, to me, one of the densest, best ways to share what you have is one-on-one. -on -one. Now, that's difficult now, for sure. But that kind of one-on-one... -on -one, talking, you know, going through artwork saying, oh, I, I got this beat when I was in Guatemala. And guess what I had to do? Really? Yeah. And I walked up the hill and I was dropping my spindle and they were laughing at me and I kept getting closer and acting up. And then they took my spindle and I dropped their spindle. A spindle is what you uh, spin yarn on. And by the time we got to the top of the hill where they're little, kiosk was, we were talking about what our parents and what our family did. So am I just sitting around doing that old woman thing <laughs> where you share stories and images of what you do? And I've done that a lot. You can go to the Smithsonian and they have me there as a storyteller. You, you know, I've done it enough and I have written in the past, but if you see my writing, I encourage you to walk right by it because I don't think it's very good. I have done those things in the past and that's how we store them. 
And so, as you just mentioned, you do have an oral history archived at the Smithsonian and their archives of American art that you recorded in 2009. What was it like for you to tell your story in an oral history format? You know, unless you're talking to somebody who's really horrid, it's a lot of fun. Uh, because I keep bringing back memories of things that were so important to me and sniglets of stuff that my parents would tell me. I'll, I'll tell you a story that my godfather told me on the way to the airport. He retired. He and my dad worked at Bethlehem Steel together. He was darker skinned. My father was lighter skinned. And he, he worked really, really next to the fire, to the heat. But my father worked as a um, crane operator up. I once asked my dad, did you ever, you never killed anybody, did you? He said, no, I heard a couple of people, but I never killed anybody. Okay. So my uh, godfather was driving me to the airport because that used to be our time together. And he said, uh, you know, one day your father came in and they called him every kind of N-word. Yellow one, red one, Indian one, because he worked with a lot of Polish people, Polak one. And they just get on him every day. My father was tall and lanky, looked a little bit like Lil Abner. My godfather said, this one guy who was just obstreperous, you know, in the corner had to yell something. My father went over to him, picked him up, and decided to drop him in the smelter. Racism is a tricky thing. And as he's walking to the smelter, people are trying to bring him down. They just bats him off like flies. Racism is a horrible thing. They bring him down just before he gets to the smelter. The story is he was never called the N-word again. Racism brings out real truth in people. My father was not a fighter, so for him to be driven to that, that's the kind of story I will tell. We, you know, we watch people march. It's pretty amazing to see people, right, march. But somebody drove her son, who's a 17-year-old boy with a semi-automatic rifle, to a crowd. Why else was he there except to shoot? That same thing was happening to Black people as they were just trying to make it home from the fields. You know, they tell you stories about Hanks. You know what Hanks is, a Hanks ghost. Hank supposedly can't cross water, so they'd be coming home after working all day in the field. Sometimes, as it got later in the year, it would be dark. They'd cross the water in some way, so the Hanks wouldn't go, but some Hanks were already over there. So that's supposedly how the bottle tree started. Because the bottle tree, they put bottles in. Cobalt blue was the favorite color. And as they're walking home, Hanks would go up, because they were mesmerized by the glitter of the bottle, but they couldn't figure out how to get out. Some people say, well, they were just fireflies who went up in the bottle and lighted, lit their way home, but they swear they were Hanks or ghosts. That to me is wonderful just to be able to sit down and, and say that, because I know I've met a couple of Hanks in my life. Do we only have one question? I cannot believe that I've been talking like this for seven hours and I got one question. No, there's, there's more, there's more. Um, another question that we had come in was, was there ever a moment when you weren't an artist or was your purpose in life always clear? I was an artist in vitro. When I came out of the womb, I said to the doctor, move, you're in my life, ba boom, boom, kazing. I went back in three times because I didn't like the first two takes. Kazangzang, right? So I'm doing it in Youngman. I'm an old Jewish. Uh, let me say, 
that I knew from the very beginning that's what I wanted to do. And I never, ever swerved or wavered. And I mean, I, I'm not against that at all. Whatever takes you down your path. Now, I fell off the path by not being the best artist that I could be sometimes. But uh, no, that's what I always did. Uh, been pretty wonderful too. Think about it, guys. When I was 68 years old, I received a MacArthur Fellowship. And I was sure I was done. I used to make jokes to people. Who do I have to sleep with to get the MacArthur? Then years passed. Who do I have to sleep with to get my money? And I was at, oh God, I was at one of those think tanks at the uh, Rockefeller something, maybe. I can't remember where it was, but it was in New York City. You know, you're at tables and you switch around. And at lunch, I'd been talking trash and I said, blah, 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 MacArthur, get my money. And the woman turned to me and said, I work at the MacArthur. Ah! Next year, I got the money. It had nothing to do with her, though, from what I understand, because she didn't have a sense of humor. That you can live this life and be surprised, invigorated, enlightened, confused, flummoxed, and still find your way. That's what I'm about. And art has afforded that liberty to me. That's that circular Southern way of answering that question. So the, an another question that we had come in is, do you see the pieces in your mind's eye before you make them? Or do you start and just follow what emerges? It's a combination of everything. Uh, many times that the way I get series going is because the first piece I made opens the door and questions keep falling out. And so I make another piece. One of the pieces you didn't see in that Dafour series came to me. It was a woman. Her legs are splayed open. You can see her vagina. She's raped, but she really isn't a full woman. She was out gathering water. So the top of her body is the little water container, also small enough to hold in your hand. Uh, one of my art godsons said, grandfather just passed. He said, come and see if there's something you can use. So I bought a bunch of meerschaum pipes from him. Meerschaums, they look like the thigh and a pair of black tights and men put them in their mouth. Basically men are pipe smokers to suck on them and bring them pleasure. So there was that direct line between enjoyment, heat, sexual sucking, and a woman who had been raped. So her legs are splayed open, but they're made of the pipes. Uh, I didn't see that in my mind's eye, but after the first one I did, and I go with my work because I'm now at a time in my life at 71 where I have tackled a lot of my skill problems, right? I'm not reinventing the wheel each time. Consequently, I can go with the flow and just move, you know, and, and still some of the later works that, that that very beginning piece that I showed you that I said was 45 inches long, that's an enormous, that's big for beadwork. And I was just like, yeah, I can do it. I got it. Thank you for sharing yes. your, your process. So this next question is from somebody who says um, he's an old friend, Thomas Mann, asking, what do you think the future of craft in America is going to look like? Hi, Tommy Mann. For those who don't know Thomas Mann is a consummate uh, genius who makes a lot of, well, jewelry, but he also is a sculptor as well. Um, and we've known each other for a long time and he, he's made a lot of food for me in New Orleans. I think crafts future is like all future. It's going to evolve into something that might be more palpable for some folks. I do believe the line between fine arts and crafts is going to get fuzzier and fuzzier. Because uh, when Rauschenberg used quilts in his paintings, I don't know why 
you know, people are thinking that elevated the quilting. I think it elevated the painting. Why is painting a cup better than making the cup? The impulse is the same for me. I think crafts now have become also a really big business with the crafts fairs that also started, to, some of them start to, to close, I hear, but that means that artists understand the business world. Thomas Mann really does. And so I think that's just going to get better. I African-Americans need, it would be good for us to uh, get more into the craft shows and other things so that we could, our work could be seen and that um, people could see the genius of the work that we do and we could make money out of it. And some of it could be mainstream. Some people are like, why mainstream it? Well, because certain elements of your artwork is, can be a business that can allow you to make money and create other uh, echelons, other things with your work. Because I make $10 earrings. Now, that is a way for me to thank my community who can't spend a lot of money on jewelry. But I hope we can do something like it this year. For the maybe 10 years, we've been doing an artist Christmas show where we all get together and we sell a affordable artwork. And you know, the folks that I went to senior high school with who are now teachers and don't have a squillion dollars, but can buy a $200 necklace and a pair of earrings from me or a comb or a bracelet. Well, it's great. And I get to see him and we talk trash. That's the best. It's the best. Yes. Someone else asked me about, I don't know, something deep. So another question that came in is about the emotions that the audience experience when they're taking in your art. And uh, sometimes they can make people cry. So is it difficult for you to tackle such subject matter? One second, please. From the third floor, uh, on that side, yes. Thanks. We're talking about, remember, it's, there's some workmen who are probably coming in. So the question again was, what, the, what does the audience react, get, do? It really varies. It or, really, really varies. Or how about for you when you're taking in the subject matter and you're, you're tackling such intense subjects? What is that like for you to make this, these, this work? I want to answer both of those. Uh, Sometimes the difference is whether or not uh, the audience knows I'm an African-American woman. Because people still don't like folks who aren't Black to deal with issues that talk about Blackness. And in the beginning, folks just, uh, uh, and I think with, still with glass, where that there are, there are Black glass blowers, but there aren't like a critical mass of us. I don't blow glass, but I work with glass. And they would see the way the work was done and they would think that I was white and they would write certain things in the book. Then sometimes I have African-American artists who, um, audience who know that I'm a, a black artist and they're pissed because I'm talking about issues that we still many of us think should be hidden. Or I'm doing a woman whose vagina is showing. When, and trust me, guys, this isn't lewd at all. When you hold her and, and see what someone has done to her, then you know how deep the assault on her is. Uh, when you talk about me, I'm always being, it's cathartic and I'm being cleansed all the time. Because for me, it's better out than in. I really am not interested and um, yuk, 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 yeah, and the little Russian dragging things around, being so incredibly burdened by stuff. I want to, once again, be elevated by it. So the things that I work with are very challenging. Um, and they help me become a better person. Because I want you to know this is about making art. And it's about sharing art with others. 
but it's about me being the bestest me. And I know that is corny as hell, but it is so true that art can be that for you if you wish it to be. And that is what I want it to be for myself. And I got that from my parents and the other ones because that's where they could shine. And it was also where they were working with the elements, with water and dirt and, you know, fire. This was a alchemical. I used that earlier. Yes, Shanna. So another question that came in was, in today's talk, you showed work in many different media. You told stories, you sang songs, and they all connected to your experience and insight in some way. When you have an idea or are moved, how do you know what the right expression of it is, the right media for, or what the right media form to use? Or do you think that's intuitive? I think it's partially intuitive, but I, I'm just incorrect a lot. I will be working on this necklace and the necklace is like, stop. And I'm thinking, oh, and because it's not a necklace, it's a piece of sculpture. And I'm trying to make that road be the right road, but it's not taking me to the right place. Or it shouldn't even be visual at all. It might be a song. I've written music before. It, 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 there's a song I wrote um, about things that had happened to me in my youth. You ruined me. I was just a baby. You not yet a man of who did that to you. Now, I don't think that I could have made it that clear, that succinct, if I'd done it in an artwork. But the music does it. And music is different than reading it. Because when you read it, you're reading it really through your voice and who you are. But when somebody is singing it to you, I wrote another one about being um, uh, an immigrant in Russia in like the 30s when a lot of, when they went over, you know, to, um, because they thought it's terrible here. It's got to be better over there. They're socialists, they're communists. And it starts with, I'm not sure I ever really breathe before. Lungs just filled with an air, just full of it. It can't be much different than it was before. As just air, I'm still me. I couldn't have, I don't think I could have made that happen in the same way, in the truest way for me. Yes, I sing when I'm, I'm talking to people, they're just like, is she all right? No, I mean, I think there's, there's so much sensory images and, and sound is one of them. So it's emblematic of the storytelling as well. And considering that exactly. storytelling is woven into all of your work, what's next for you? What, what's on the docket for you? Well, hopefully today I'll get the chimney, as we say in Baltimore, lined. You know, for me, it's staying alive. And it's for me being able to pull the truth out of these materials. That's once again, hippie pattern, but it is what I mean. It is for me to be able to be comfortable and at one with this great gift that's been given to me. I talk a lot of trash. Look at the size of these eyeglasses. But I'm in no way not aware of just how blessed I am to have this ability and to also have the, the ability in my past to travel around the world and share it and not have a whole bunch of terrible things happen to me because I'm a woman and because I'm an African-American woman. I want to keep finding the truth in what I do and then share the truth. Because I really do believe the truth sets you free. And I think we're in a time right now with all the fake news and the fake this and the fake whatever, where artists just need to keep working. I'm not saying you need to make political work. Just be true to yourself and to the medium that you explore and it, it will just push it out in the, in the 
ethos. I know, and I know what that sounds like, but I believe it's true. And it is what many cultures have based what they do on. They have integrated art within their everyday life, not just the, you know, music with the keynote PowerPoint. That's the guy. That's his hip hop name now. The guy who ran the slides. And thank you very much for doing that, hip hop, key point, whatever his name is. You're welcome. Um, thank you very much for doing that. Otherwise, uh, he, known as Joyce, we actually have, did I We have one more question before we close out this wonderful presentation, which is What is the media or material that you haven't worked with yet but want to in the future? Wow. I really don't know. Because I've worked with a lot of materials. In, in, in the back of my head, it might be like um, casting metal, maybe bronze or something. But every time I make a really big piece like that 15 foot Harriet Tubman, I want to go make little things. You know, so I, I don't know. I got I've told you that I've been a performer, but I've been on TV and I, I've been in movies. I've done things. I've done a lot of things in my life. And actually what I think I want to do more is just become even better, a better beater. And when I say better, I not only mean about my skill, but my ability to, to drag that truth out of and to share it with others. So I don't know if I'm looking for something new as much as I'm maybe looking for the newness in what I already do. And before we go, let me say thank you for choosing me. I, this was a new uh, PowerPoint for me. And I want to thank uh, Keynote for being so wonderful and for all of you for inviting me and also for the ladies who told the stories uh, that was really quite sweet, and thank you very much. And there, you know, all of this, this is fabulous right there. Thank Thanks. you, Joyce. This was everything that we hoped it would be. Thank you so much. Great. And I'm getting paid. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Take and care. for Kelly for putting this together, and Dan and Faith and Chris and our interpreters as well. So, yeah, yes. thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.